Okay, well, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, second WhatsApp EU uh, talk. Uh, my name is Mariolina Liantonio. I am a professor at uh, the Law Faculty of Maastricht University and also co-director uh, together with Paul Stevenson of uh, Campus Brussels. Um, Campus Brussels, so welcome to Campus Brussels, although virtually. Um, Campus Brussels is Maastricht University Interfaculty Hub in the EU capital. Um, what do we do in Campus Brussels? is mostly organizing, supporting activities in the field of education, research, networking and knowledge transfer, many of which are linked to Maastricht University internationalization strategy uh, and to projects that Maastricht University leads as the European University of the Netherlands. Um, as Campus Brussels, we have recently launched the WhatsApp EU talk series um, with the aim to inform the Maastricht University community and the wider university community about a number of developments in and around uh, EU policy, as well as to encourage a broader reflection about, in general, how EU policy impacts us as citizens, as academics, um, as students, and so on. Um, Students are, of course, the lifeblood of our university community, and Bastrit University in particular attaches great value to student participation, student satisfaction, and closely wants to involve students in all aspects of university life. Uh, to give an example, um, a student holds the position of vice chair at UFE, um, the European University Alliance of 10 universities that Maastricht University is leading. Um, the European Union institutions are also increasingly aware of the importance of uh, involving students in, uh, in deciding, uh, in determining EU policies that affect them, such as, for example, uh, the, the famous exchange programs within Erasmus+, Plus, the harmonization of educational standards across Europe, and putting forward, uh, of course, measures that help to increase access to education to a wider number number of um, students across the EU. Um, in this context, um, here is our guest for today, um, Mr. Jakub Grodetsky, um, who represents the European Students' Union. The Student Union represents almost 20 million students and is one of the organizations that the EU indeed consults on a regular basis in all matters that are related or having an impact on students, student life across the EU. So Mr. Grodetsky is serving as Vice President of the European Students' Union, um, and we have invited him today to gain a better understanding of the EU policies in which students are closely involved. Um, Jakub's primary focus within the organization is quality of higher education, the implementation of the Bologna process commitments, and the topic quite important and very current topic of digitalization in higher education. Um, previously, um, uh, our speaker today worked as quality assurance expert of the Polish Accreditation Committee and the European Students' Union Quality Assurance Pool of Experts. Uh, as an academic background, uh, as he was uh, just telling me in our chat previously to this meeting, he has a background in mechanical engineering and uh, management and production engineering at the University of Science and Technology in Krakow. Uh, a couple of housekeeping rules before I leave the floor to our guest today. Uh, Jakub will deliver a presentation for about 20, 25 minutes he will introduce us to the European Student Union, walk us through the main EU policies that they are engaged in, tell us more about how students can get involved in the European Student Union, and then we will open the floor for questions. And um, for that purpose, please use your virtual hand to uh, request the floor. Uh, without further ado, um, Jakub, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ma Mariolina. Uh, my name is Jakub Grodetsky, has been said, and uh, I'm representing the European Students' Union, which is uh, the uh, umbrella organization of uh, 45 Students' Union from 40 countries. And thank you very much for invitation here. And I, I really believe that this uh, part of our activity, so networking also with the students' communities, with the uh, campuses, with different universities, is along 
the uh, involvement within the policies of the either national uh, level or in the EU level mostly uh, that what our, our organization is doing is very much crucial to also keep uh, the connection uh, with the realities on the grassroots level, but also now in the previous uh, times has been mentioned about the UFA Alliance, it's been very much seen that the EU level actually policies and ideas are also overlapping with the very grassroots uh, possibilities that are taking place on the university through, for example, the uh, flagship initiative, which European alliances is. But we're going to go to that uh, later, definitely. I would like to um, invite you all here uh, on the on the Zoom call and everyone uh, uh, after watching this, uh, watching these resources uh, um, afterwards, maybe this conference to either contact us, whatever you have any questions, or also uh, to keep this more informal way today uh, to also interact you when you feel so uh, and maybe there will be some time afterwards to uh, to have some discussions and the questions that you may raise i will now share my screen and shortly uh, we'll go through the presentation especially uh, starting with the very informative part on what SU is because sometimes it's indeed the fact uh, that uh, knowledge about ESU, about the student uh, student structures on the national level, on the EU level, sometimes are not reaching fully uh, to the to the uh, to the to the to the ground to the to the students that are enrolled and are focusing very much on their own uh, developments and curricula. So it's it's nice to nice to know who are actually on the different levels is representing you, how it works, and how it actually contributes to the whole uh, transparency systems that we are having and involvement of students uh, within the uh, within the different levels of participation. So I will share now the screen with the presentation. I uh, just please nod if you can see it. Uh, okay, great. And I will continue doing that. So uh, thanks again for uh, for me for having me today here and I will move forward with uh, telling you what SU is uh, at the beginning. So originally we were funded in 82. So next year we're going to have a big year of 40 year anniversary. It was Official, uh, originally West European Student Information Bureau. It was uh, um, built up by, I think, six or seven countries. I should know that, but uh, of course the numbers uh, are, are there. I don't necessarily uh, remember now, but it grew. It grew very much. So it was Western European Student Information Bureau at the beginning, but after the, 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 the political changes in Europe, after the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain, after establishing, uh, especially in 99, the Bologna, uh, cooperation Bologna process, uh, the union ex expanded to, to the 40 countries currently and to the 45 uh, student unions. And our mission is to represent, defend and strengthen the students' uh, educational, uh, democratic and political and social rights. And we are working for sustainable, accessible and high quality higher education in Europe. We are run by students, we are autonomous, uh, representative, our representative representativity comes from uh, the students on the local uh, levels, on the national student union. So our members have a very strict criteria to join our um, movement when it comes, they have to fulfill the criteria of uh, full uh, autonomous representation. They should cover as much as possible students uh, officially towards the authorities on the country level, and they should be acknowledged by students as their official representativity. That's why it also gives our leg legitimacy in the scope of European higher education policies, which are actually a very good example of stakeholder-led uh, policies that are happening on the EU, because uh, simply uh, our voice as, as a university voice, as teacher voice, as a, a voice of different stakeholder organization in Europe is very much heard uh, in this sector. So it's a combination of, uh, of a very big involvement on the, on, the, on, the, on the national level, but also the stakeholders have very big uh, word to say, and that's gonna go later. So we, this is our map of our members, just shortly to give you an overview. And what is our structure, right? We have the legislative body. I'm gonna go shortly with the organizational talk here, but uh, let's do it uh, quite quickly. Our board meeting, so all of those members are meeting twice a year and they're setting up the policy of the organization which they would like to uh, achieve when it comes to education, accessibility, social dimension, quality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, each country has two votes and the delegates are meeting twice a year. That, set ups, that sets up the plan of work for the executive body, which is executive committee. We have one president, two vice presidents and seven executive committee coordinators. And we are dividing the tasks that are uh, falling under different policy areas between us and executing this plan of work earlier. 
And according to that, also Secretariat is working with us, which is a very important part of our organization. Secretariat is helping us managing the projects uh, as a part of our, uh, our operations as definitely funded through the educational projects, either on those topics that I mentioned before. So we are based in Brussels and there is our Secretariat plus the presidency. And the executive body members are working from uh, their respective countries and we are meeting um, uh, of course, in the current reality through Zoom, but usually we are uh, we are meeting uh, in person as well, also on the board meetings uh, of the European Students Union. Uh, so uh, what we do, uh, we conduct European wide research policy development, definitely, for example, when the pandemic came, uh, we did few surveys on the Europe, European wide uh, surveys uh, of our students, what were the um, biggest uh, barriers of participating for students uh, into the into the classes we are conduct we are we are transferring this knowledge to the respective uh, authorities to say what is most important for students either when it comes to the mobility uh, uh, freeze or when it comes to the shortages of uh, students housing or when it comes to the uh, possible um, the possible issue with the tuition fees so either where there are flexible uh, payments possible etc cetera, etc cetera. we are coordinating the projects on education uh, issues and we do advocacy and representation and this advocacy and representation actually uh, mostly is related to the Bologna process, which was happening, which is happening already for um, 20 years. And uh, right now, also, it's very closely uh, we're cooperating with the EU institutions, with the European Commission, mostly on the recent developments of European education uh, area. So we are very much monitoring and uh, putting the students' perspective on how these two uh, actually main plans that uh, were setting up the landscape of European higher education area are going uh, together. So those are our recent events. I will definitely share this presentation uh, after you, if you are interested. There are some links afterwards, but uh, we will come uh, further. So, um, so also uh, here you can uh, you can see how how different layers are overlapping with each other. So definitely starting from the institutional level, uh, the Senate councils, the universities, which are more than 5,000 in Europe, are being represented by the national level students' union, right? So if you are students enrolled in the in the university on the local level it's most likely that you are rep being represented on the national level with your national students union and this national students union as i being said are um, partners are members of the european uh, students union and we are mostly uh, the, uh, cooperating with the bodies on the european level the council of europe the european commission bologna uh, partners bologna secretariat but also stakeholder organizations like a European Network for Quality Assurance, European University Association, Lifelong Learning Platform, ESN, et cetera. But also recently we um, were uh, helping to found the Global Students Forum actually, which is also the network uh, organization that um, unifies students from the different continents. There are also network umbrella organizations in Africa, like All Africa Students Union, uh, also in uh, Asia and Oceania, uh, also in the, both Americas. So we are trying to also uh, build up this network right now but this is the role of the gsf right now but it's very important to also have a standpoint to the global organizations such as unesco uh, etc a bit of the bologna process which is the um, i would say process that gave to esu very much legitimacy because we are very involved from its beginning um, it was it is already uh, having 22 years uh, the participants of the bologna process include now 49 countries the san marino joined last uh, uh, last november during the rome uh, ministerial conference and the bfug and has 49 uh, members as is not of them not one of them as was a consultative member then but we are very listened to we are also uh, co-chairing some uh, working groups for example working group of the social dimension which has been very much reflected into the annex of ministerial communique um uh, this this uh, this year uh, but we're gonna go to that maybe maybe some uh, some information about the bologna process definitely are there to uh, to recap so what was that it is a set of the ministerial conference when minister ministers of higher education are meeting every two three years and they are setting up the priorities of higher education system developments in europe uh, throughout the throughout the years there are many um I would say developments that being that, that have been established by the Bologna process that you probably perfectly know as students. You have ECTS points, you have a recognition procedures, you have a quality assurance procedures with European standards and guidelines uh, that allows students to actually structurally participate in uh, enhancing the study programs. You can study your, your first cycle, second cycle, PhD cycle, so first, second, third cycle. This is also Bologna implementation, um, re re result of the implementation that you 
are having those tools. So the Bologna process is going on. Of course, the students that are arriving to the higher education systems not necessarily are aware of, of where it comes from because that simply might not be the, the core interest of the students. We are trying to care of what good was there implemented from the student's perspective, and we are very much contributing to its future. So right now, the new priorities are being set. Uh, for the new period of uh, Bologna process, and we are uh, involved in many, many working groups within the Bologna uh, follow-up group. Why it's important? The original aim was to develop the European higher education area by 2010. Uh, it was set to, comp to set up the comparable uh, degree based on the three cycle system uh, to ensure the high employability of graduates, to promote students' mobility, and develop the European dimension of higher education, which actually uh, happened by then. Shortly here, I'm not going to go through the table discussion. You have the source below, but this is the screenshot from the Bologna implementation report. And as you can see, you have, you have here different implementations within the different years on the different uh, ministerial conferences. That's, that's for later if you are interested in this. And what we are feeding uh, to this process also from the side of ESU, which is, I think, very important that we are keeping the students' eyes on implementation of the Bologna process. So on every ministerial conference, we are actually issuing our publication called Bologna with Students' Eyes. And before the conference is taking place, uh, we are issuing this publication uh, when our members from the national level are pointing out on which developments have been implemented well, which may be not yet being fully implemented, and what are their feelings about the students' involvement in the various, various policies that we are mm, dealing with. So those are the chapters of the of the publications that uh, that recent one has. So you can see social dimension, quality assurance, recognition, mobility issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But those are the chapters. Feel free to visit us website uh, for uh, to download the Bologna with Students Eyes uh, publication and see what's being uh, discussed there. Now, for example student participation in decision making bodies that's one of the chapter and very much uh, important tool for students being involved on the national local uh, level etc we are uh, being involved in the senates we are being involved uh, in the in the uh, faculty councils and so on but it's not the case everywhere and the percentages of this uh, students involvement are very varied from country to country so uh, we are also monitoring the legislation uh, and regulations that that are ensuring this minimum level of student participation in the decision making bodies and it's all reflected in the in the publication, but definitely us being involved uh, um, in the in the in the uh, in the councils are giving us the the, the strong voice, uh, actually embedded embedded in uh, into the into the the, to the real voice uh, real voting uh, that are taking place in the universities. But the involvement itself does not necessarily equals outcomes. So there are different stages of student involvement. There is uh, something very much discussed, which is called tokenism and tokenistic um, participation. So we, we are also advocating, and our national student unions are also very much advo advocating for this, to not make the structural involvement only tokenistic, because there is a very big difference of being involved as a student and um, basically have a seat somewhere. But there is a difference of this students being able and supported from the side of the institution um, to actually have a deep understanding and uh, to be listened to uh, on what students uh, points of view is and this point of view should be also reflected in the policies of institutions national education systems etc etc so we are advocating for a very latter stage and latter um, I would say development and, and level of students involvement but of course there is a pathway and there's the different countries different unions different realities are on the different level and of course we cannot be sure that and every time we are gonna remain at the level that we have achieved because the democracy the student representation itself is a fragile uh, fragile issue that we have to care about very much at every uh, time uh, of, of, of our proceedings so uh, when it comes to uh, a bit of the jump to the quality assurance, I'm sorry for that, but I'm uh, very much a quality assurance based uh, oriented um, uh, in the students movement. That's, that's how I also started. So just to reflect how I believe that quality assurance as a structured involvement is very, uh, plays a very uh, bigger, big role in this involvement, because the European standards and guidelines, which are setting up the standards for quality education and for quality of the programs on the universities, is actually existing from 2015 as a, I mean, 2005 and in 2015 it was uh, reviewed, but some points within the ESGs are, uh, are directly um, putting up the students as a must 
in the different uh, layers of quality uh, quality assurance, uh, if in the, in the levels of the program, in the levels of the university, and also uh, in external review. So this actually structurized participation is ensuring that some students who are being interested, of course, it's not the interest of every student studying because people are pursuing their own interest dreams and uh, it's not necessarily um, a thing for all, but a lot of students are being dragged to this and they are able to take care of the quality of their own programs, their own education, and basically for the programs for their peers, their colleagues in the, uh, in the classrooms, in the faculties, in the program level. We are also uh, monitoring the reality of quality assurance student pools. For example, uh, ESU as organization on the side also have the quality assurance students experts pool, which is able to provide international well-trained student experts for uh, the purpose of quality assurance uh, to the agencies of quality assurance uh, that are checking the quality assurance externally on the different levels uh, and definitely the QA student pools are uh, also flourishing in the different countries and providing the very structural community that are dealing with the student rights and ensuring those student rights in the in the in the university level i'm uh, quite jumping over the slides because every every of these topics is uh, actually a topic for a, for a separate presentation but i just want to give an overview what is the main scope of us so that kind of a that kind of a chart you can find in the publication in the in the in the in the bologna with student eyes publication so for example you have the barriers of involvement etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, about, for example, lack of information about quality assurance among the student's body. I think it's the same issue with the actually student representation because of the uh, promotion of student representation and how it's being supported also from the side of the institution, from the national regulations, but also how it's uh, how the tradition of student participation is different in the different countries, different realities. It's a it's a big barrier to actually um, to actually implement uh, and and develop a lot of uh, a lot of engagement. But but students are working on it in every university in every country, and we are basically constantly uh, trying to enhance this. And this is the never-ending story, I would say. Okay, a bit of the EU policies and how we are involved in this. Uh, as I've been saying about the Bologna process, which is already there for twenty-one years. Um, and it's having a lot of commitments that some of them are fulfilled more, some of them less, but definitely it's unified to the European higher education area um, throughout the years now. But there is, uh, there is also very, very interesting times we are having in because it, um, the higher education area also uh, waited for quite a long of time to have its political response a bit from the EU uh, side from the member states that member states uh, also pushed uh, to have the policy reflection on the, how higher education uh, should be uh, should be uh, should be developed how it should be supported and how to make it comparable and competitive uh, in the global uh, realities right now so the idea from the side of the commission is also uh, now on the on the table very much there have been two communiques uh, more than two communiques sorry but the main communique is about the european education area achieved by 2025 but there are also different agendas about skills, about digital education action plan, um, about um, yeah, basically skills agenda, which is aimed to reskill and upskill the people when it comes to the needs of the current labor market, when it comes to uh, fast changing society and the nature of employment, and so on and so on. So uh, me uh, from the STEM background, uh, looking a bit of this chart, I never quite understood uh, uh, uh much how, how how these axes are being here uh, put but that's the six priorities of the eea uh, of the european education area based on the three layers so we have geopolitical dimension higher education teachers and trainers layers and then we have the three axes of green and digital transition as you uh, as you very much probably know the recovery and resilience funds from the eu are very much including the green and digital transitions uh, within one of the um, uh, priorities for funding and for a recovery plan for Europe, the inclusion and gender equality uh, and the quality of education itself. So those are the priorities of the EEA. And what ESSOS is working about it, it's working very closely from the, very, from the beginning. We've been participating in the working groups on the main topics concerning higher education uh, um, higher education within this European education area, because uh, this, this community and this European education area is not concerning only higher education, but as an organization, we are focusing uh, mostly on the on the higher education uh, higher education students and students basically. So um, we've been participating in the working groups on European universities, the micro credentials working groups, also another initiative that is uh, interesting right now, uh, because the short learning opportunities are being seen as a 
um, as a possible development of the concept of how uh, we will be learning. So there is a big discussion of the value of the long term, long degree right now, comparing to the short learning offerings, which are anyway being offered by the private providers. Uh, probably during the pandemic times, some of you logged in into different uh, private platforms, uh, mostly uh, US based and uh, try to pursue some courses to issue yourself a certificate in the field that you might not have within the program. So making these uh, programs more flexible, giving them more uh, short learning opportunities, either within the programs or outside, also would allow the lifelong learners to come back to the education, to reskill their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their knowledge, their education, to be able to conduct a more, um, uh, I would reshape their, their jobs, reskill, upskill for the future uh, needs of the, of the labor market, but of, of course, to also pursue their interest and develop as a, as a, as a human. So, mm, Basically, we are participating in a lot of the consultations on digital education action plan, for example, digital, digital education action plan also landed up in a very right moment, I would say. And unfortunately, we have the pandemic outside here, but the digital education, which has been never developed so, uh, so, so highly right in the past uh, past year. Uh, definitely landed in the current moment. So uh, there are also issues related to the accessibility to internet, right? right? We have in, in EU itself, we are uh, very divided when it comes to accessibility for the internet for learners. We have a countries uh, reaching nearly 100% accessible access, access to the internet uh, until the, the countries which uh, having uh, nearly 60% for the learners. So that's definitely an issue also to solve infrastructurally if the uh, digital education will have to be remained. But of course, digital education is also allowing the new learners to step in into education, which didn't have a chance before during to, to the costly uh, investment in education that is still uh, um, very visible uh, and causing very much inequalities in our societies on who can actually pursue the education. And that's also the very much important um, field for us to, to, to take care about it. A statement on SO vision of European education area, you can uh, write it down, it's on the hyperlink, I will show you the presentation before. We are also organizing capacity building activities, so for the national student unions, for the, um, for during our meetings, but also outside it, about different uh, policy topics uh, that you are seeing here. And how relevant is to us's work? I'm not going to go through every bullet point here, but it's quite much. We are uh, focusing on European universities, the possible developments of the European degree, uh, European students card, new Erasmus program, of course, now has been uh, has been launched in 2021, 2027. There is a governance framework um, reflected in the European education area for, for the area itself, like maybe 2024. Uh, that's going to happen. But a lot of a lot of initiatives are there and we are monitoring and trying to monitor as much policy um, uh, as, as possible. And that's very much overlapping and it's interest of our unions as well, because that's going to at the end transfer to the local and national uh, realities and the implementation of it is the key to success if you want to have it uh, well implemented, if you want to have it equally implemented, all of those initiatives. So that's very important to to set it well uh, when setting the framework of each of those and we are trying to provide the students perception on those topics. Uh, so <clears throat> our general position and activities, uh, our general position on the EEA itself is an inclusive, accessible, sustainable and quality EEA. You can basically uh, read it all. It's, uh, it's uh, just the words right here, but uh, believe me, uh, participating in so many groups uh, goes into very detail on how, for example, European universities, we see it's uh, these initiatives to be developed uh, uh, well, how micro-credential systems, what barriers it causes, what opportunities and so on and so on. So that's just a short overview uh, of the position of the EEA. Uh, and I want to mention a bit of the initiative itself because uh, Commission, uh, European Commission, and uh, basically uh, it dragged very much attention uh, the initiative to the to the current discourse on higher education. It's um, it's a European Universities initiative. It's a flagship initiative of the European Commission. There is currently 41 alliances um, running on the pilot programs. There is 280. Uh, one universities within the within the different alliances um, joined, but um, it is it is currently the pilot phase. So definitely, what is going to happen now? Uh, it's it, it's it is being perceived as a testing grounds for the new way how higher education could be provided, or how it can be more inclusive, how to provide more uh, more uh, connected courses between the different universities, how to boost up the mobility opportunities between the networks, and so on and so on. But um, Indeed, uh, the alliances uh, are, are aimed to be structural and long-term cooperations. It's a new idea for kind of 
uh, having uh, having these cooperations. For example, it was very uh, use, uh, It was very popular to have a bilateral uh, agreements, which of course will stay there. But there is something new. Uh, idea always uh, needed to, to to pursue and I believe also it's it's very much contributive for the students reality because it's the first time actually when so structurally chance for students is to network uh, so structurally between different networks from uh, from Europe uh, from Europe on the local level so the local unions are contacting their peers uh, in the alliances within the alliances and there uh, there may be a learning from each other that's that's the one idea second one seamless mobility 50 percent of students in physical virtual virtual blended mobility of course the virtual mobility will not uh, uh, um, be the same as digital one but uh, the international aspect of learning is very much important and uh, will be facilitated also under this initiative the possible development of European degree, the European statute, I mean, those are probably talks for the for the very much uh, latter stage uh, in, the, in the years from now, but definitely the European alliances as a initiatives, we see it as a kind of a change maker in the sense that there, there should provide a space for something new, for not 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 like crazy pursuing something new but uh, indeed we might uh, need a, a different approach for how a higher education is being conducted how learning and teaching is being conducted how to maybe uh, make more individualized uh, learning opportunities for uh, for students across the europe and definitely the testing grounds and providing this open space is very much of course there's a lot of barriers currently um, um between in, in front that are standing in front of this initiative uh, the universities are existing in a very defragmented higher education area when it comes to the system when it comes to local realities when it comes to legislation on the country level but uh, that's that's indeed very worth to discuss what i would like the most about the initiative is that actually sparked the discussion and ignited the discussion what can we do so that's that's added value in itself our position on the european universities we definitely want to avoid a two-speed European higher education area. So we also believe that this uh, th there should be a very big balance between the hopefully to achieve excellence that are coming from the from the European universities, but on the other hand, to not to create the double speed that uh, some of those who entered the train and will be the uh, the, the, the universities within the alliances uh, will actually will have a different starting point from those uh, left behind. So that's the very uh, crucial point. When it comes to student representation, we very much advocate for the meaningful student representation getting students on board from the beginning of the writing phase, including them into work packages. I know uh, Yufa is very much uh, caring about student representation uh, and uh, by, by, I, I, just, I just read a bit, but also had a chance to, uh, to, to read uh, and to hear a bit of the Yufa alliances between different meetings. So, so how students are being involved in the, in the town, hall, town hall and in, the, in, the, in, this, in this main decisive body and so on and so on. Uh, has been mentioned at the beginning of the session. It's very much also important for us that, that students should elect students, right? So, so if there are established structures for students, it's very much important that the student representation within the Alliance uh, should be actually um, linked to the students' movement locally. Because at the end, if the, the initiative is aimed to be successful, uh, probably the white student's body should be uh, aware on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the possibilities of the opportunities that the European University is bringing on. Um, that's why uh, the, the established student structures are also providing this, this, this link, this, this possibility of communication to reach out uh, for those students. That's why we advocate for that. We advocate also, also for as much physical mobility as possible. Of course, maybe in the sustainable way, we are hopefully getting into the point when uh, some uh, initiatives also will be uh, concerning the transportation opportunities in Europe that maybe uh, for students that's very important uh, I'm sometimes I'm hearing the, the anecdotes about like flying with the cheap Ryanair and opportunities and then why didn't you check train and so on but like of course uh, young people would be perfectly happy by taking the train but unless uh, un until it will cost like 10 times more sometimes than the Ryanair flight I'm sorry for uh, saying saying the saying the company. Nothing nothing can be done. Um, nothing can be done actually uh, to to combat that from the purely economical issue. Um, yes, and that's basically our our standpoints on the European universities here. And here uh, there are some examples of what we have done so far. We have resolutions and statement about the European universities. We are organizing the webinars, networking, um, the meetings with the European university students on a, on the country level, on the national level. Uh, we will be um, looking forward to also 
uh, to also see the results of the survey that are going to be sent by European Commission. And we co-created this to, to make this survey uh, answering very important questions for the students' perspective on how students are being involved in the European universities. And at the end, we want to gather very much good practices when it comes to uh, students, uh, in students oriented initiatives within the alliances that could be replicated in other alliances, but also outside of the of the project itself. We also very much welcome the direction that is currently being taken that also uh, it's not only EU uh, member states being available for the for the for the for the future idea of the program, but also the, the there is much big looking towards how to expand it also to European higher education area uh, as a whole. Also, like I'm I'm talking here very much about the policy, very much about the topics that are very much on the table and are important for us, but all of those are overlapping with the situation outside. So the impact of our mandate, and just to just to reflect on that, we are being elected for one year as SU representatives. So you can imagine jumping to the students' movement and to the policy level is just a blink of an eye. So sometimes initiatives are being there for four or five years, and then we have to catch up very quickly on what's going on, but the initiative, it's running in its own pace. But all of those initiatives anyway, regardless of what it is, has been impacted by the COVID um, uh, pandemic. And also that's what is good. Uh, and also what is very big responsible on the, on the future uh, policymakers that to reflect the outcomes of the pandemic and the reality that students have faced during this very hard time and still are facing uh, to, the, to the upcoming policies. So the, we also welcome the very uh, uh, kind of reshaping the, the policies and taking the COVID impact into consideration um, in the policies that are uh, currently being reshaped due to the pandemic. So here, just a few data. I don't know what's happening with the slide. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So for example, there are some uh, research conducted by ESO as well in this regard. We, we, we've monitored uh, uh, along with the Zadar University conducted the uh, survey on 20,000 students. And for example, you can, see, <clears throat> you can see here the differences when it comes to the resources for online studying. We are talking simply about the computers, about the desk, but what about the internet connection, the quiet place to study, the course study material. So it's going to be also important if we want to go into the direction of uh, um, digital education and opening up these possibilities to take care about this dimension of uh, providing this, uh, um, these opportunities for learners. So to not offer the education without earlier providing the, the well infrastructure. The second thing about the workload, we observed that the workload increased by 50% uh, for most of the survey, for most of the students that, uh, that were participating in the survey. That's, uh, that's quite a lot. And uh, simply um, the new approach for learning and teaching, if that's going to be a hybrid uh, uh, response to the uh, learning reality after the pandemic, it cannot be simply transferring what has happened before pandemic, during the pandemic to the reality post pandemic. I think there is a big uh, chance to, to also think on how the learning and teaching strategies are being organized, how to not overburden the students with the workload, but rather utilize the, the tools and the, the, the experiences that, that students, learners, and teachers, obviously, because that's also concerning the teacher. Uh, this group is also very important from our point of view, how teachers are being supported on the level of the university and how the learning and teaching is being uh, conducted. Um, learners' employment, another, another very big issue. Students uh, are having uh, a lot of temporary jobs. The nearly 30% uh, responded that they lost the temporary job. Uh, the permanent job was lost in the cases of 12.2%. Uh, so you can see how much does it also impact the financial situation of students. Um, that, also, uh, that also affected the tuition fees. And uh, for 75% of the cases, the fee payment remained the same. Some institutions has introduced flexible ways of paying uh, fees uh, during the coronavirus and so on. So you can see how, how this all overlaps and how it's all impacts the very fragile, I would say, reality of the young, uh, you, mostly in most of the cases, youth uh, people pursuing the education path. So interesting uh, results you can, you can find uh, by Googling the, 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 basically the uh, name of the survey on the bottom of the screen. I will share that later. And basically, what are the challenges for the future? We are going to both as students learners but also as a youth movement as a students unions on the national level on the on the local level and also as so we have to we have to think how the student movement have to uh, like uh, rebirth in the sense of how to drag the attention of the possible new people getting into the movement because we are already in home for one and a half year the normal recruitment process was uh, very hard to carry on 
Uh, so, so it's also very, very um, important to 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 contribute on how to uh, how to make the youth sector flourishing. There is also big discussion uh, under the scope of the Conference of the Future of Europe under the youth uh, strategies for Europe currently happening. So, how to make the youth more engaged in the societal uh, scope when it comes to digital and green transformation of higher education? Definitely, most important topic for upcoming years: uh, reskilling, upskilling, and uh, learning opportunities. Uh, as I've been saying uh, about micro credentials um, initiatives, how it will be conducted, how it would respond to the needs. Uh, structural inequalities, access education for all. Of course, we are saying this all, and that's our main goal. And we believe as ESU that education is a, is a right. Uh, it's, it's not a privilege. So uh, definitely uh, the social dimension and the role of the education in the society is, uh, definitely have to, be, um, have to be going in this way. And that's very reflected also in the, uh, in the uh, Rome communique and its annexes about the social dimension of higher education. Um, supporting the involvement of students. So from the level of university, of the national authorities, on the local levels, I think the support is very important. So financing the students' movements, financing the student organizations, just to flourish this contact again. When people will go back to universities, they also need social contact uh, between each other. So, so, so student organizations cannot suffer from, uh, from this pandemic, definitely. And the whole democratic citizenship after, what is the role of the universities? Where are we at? That's, the, that's also the challenge and the question for the next decade that is very much uh, discussed in the various meetings, various topics, and also it's a main concern of the students' unions uh, as we hear. And at the end, uh, how can you contribute to <clears throat> students' movement and participate in our activities? So we live in 2020 plus, that means you should definitely follow us on the social media channels and stay tuned. We are uh, having, <coughs> I'm sorry uh, about the, uh, a lot of talking, uh, but uh, yes, the, indeed the social media channels and the content that is there on the social media uh, uh, will allow you to follow us uh, with the activities that we are, uh, we are having. Um, participate in different webinars, projects. I know it's uh, it's hard now to participate in uh, webinars and be staying involved and, and very um, very active when it comes to because we are all having this kind of Zoom digital fatigue when it comes to participation. But definitely there will be opportunities. We have part of our events are open uh, to the public, so we can you can also contribute to the various consultations. If you see the consultations uh, of the European Commission. Uh, for example, there are public uh, consultations being launched. You can also uh, write to us if you have some standpoint. Maybe also uh, engage through your national union, through your local union. If you're at the start of uh, feeling that your inner uh, energy is there to be engaged in the, in the students' movement, uh, reach, reach them out, reach the national union, uh, reach the local union. And, uh, and be active. Definitely, that's the that's the starting point. That's the way uh, to be to be active and more involved. Uh, join our statutory events uh, if you are interested. Also, information on that you're gonna find on social media. And indeed, uh, look what uh, look out from what is being uh, done. Stay active uh, and uh, and definitely uh, follow our activity. And that's that was a very uh, good uh, good opportunity for me also to share uh, about ESU itself uh, some uh, some information because. There is a big gap actually between between ESU and the and the local level, between national level, simply because of the nature of the student movement. At some point, we are very much focused on the uh, on the policy side of the of the very huge plan of work that we are uh, conducting. But definitely, the social connection are uh, taking place uh, very much on the social media right now. It's it's very important to stay uh, tuned. It's very important to stay engaged uh, through the uh, through the through the activities that we are. Also having an internet uh, in the in the in the in either in the Facebook, in Instagram, in the Twitter. Uh, so so definitely that's a great way to start. And uh, sorry for uh, jumping out from topics from one to another. It's it was uh, quite challenging to to put it in a, such a short uh, short pace. Uh, but I think I gave uh, a, quite an insight of what ESU is, what ESU does, and uh, that would be from my side when it comes to the presentation. And I'm very open for the questions from your side, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Jakub, very, very much. This was uh, uh, extremely interesting, very informative, and I would directly uh, ask whether from the floor there are any questions at, uh, at this stage. I see Felix with an actual hand raised. Yes, I, I can't raise my hand because I'm hosting, so I don't have the, the option. So, um, Felix, please. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you for a very, very indeed comprehensive and uh, rich uh, presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is related to the European universities. So you explained that at the moment you are um, organized in a sort of, you know, based on the national uh, unions and so on. But what European universities or one of the things that they try to do is to build sort of the European student, right? So arguably the students that will be there in, uh, you know, a few years time will no longer be a national student, but they will be a European student. How do you think this may impact the European Students' Union when you will have a student that doesn't necessarily belong to a country, but that wants to directly engage you know, with this European level? Uh, do you foresee that you will be uh, changing your structures to accommodate that? Uh, or you know, uh, is this something that uh, you know, uh, you're being, um, yeah, you're keeping in mind? And the second question would be more, I think, um, how can we help? How can we um, help you uh, in uh, you know raising awareness among the student community? Because of course, for us, it's very important that you know our students are engaged uh, and aware of uh, you know policy developments, which is why we organize these talks, uh, and we will of course be making the recording available to you know our new students uh, on a regular basis. Uh, but do you have any recommendations for us as to you know how we can motivate uh, our student population to be engaged uh, you know in, in the European Students Union or just in you know student representation in general uh, maybe you know with some personal experiences that you can just uh, tell us you know what's in it uh, for them thank if you I, if i can yeah. just uh, jump in because i had exactly a, in fact a similar uh, question or complementary question to the one about awareness and visibility which uh, felix uh, just raised um, and i have to confess that having been a student in uh, two countries um, in none of the two was i ever aware that the the, the student union as, as as such actually existed at the national level so let alone the european one um, so i wonder um, as, as, a, as a student, as a student of Maastricht University, because as we are here hosting this talk um, on, on behalf of the UM, the Maastricht University community, um, where should they, where should one, a student go to find uh, um, resources and the necessary network? And um, a bit also linked to the first question of Felix, we have, of course, a very, very international student population. So as such, these our students, several of them are studying in the Netherlands, but they are not Dutch, nor will they very likely stay in the Netherlands for their um, working career. So is there any way that also um, one should cater for these um, perhaps different or additional needs? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, Lea also with the question. I, I can uh, either answer the three of those or I can take all of all of them, but maybe maybe I'll answer and then... Uh, yes, yeah. I will suggest that and okay. I will give the floor to Lea afterwards. Yes. Okay. So uh, starting from the European University question and about like the European students and at the end, uh, indeed, the, the possible degree that would be received when, when, when at the end we will reach the point when mm, the Alliance itself will, uh, will provide the European kind of degree education. I mean, it's too bold to say right now that it's going to be called European degree or something, because of course there is no clear definition or the way where we are still, because I have been saying, Mm, this is the beginning of the phase, and that's how uh, we are uh, we are actually developing the different concepts of how it could be looking. But uh, you were saying that we are uh, <clears throat> we are mostly uh, dealing with the national levels and how it reflects the uh, the, the participation of the national um, kind of universities in the alliances. And indeed, we don't see the role of ESO. Mm, I'm sorry, <coughs> very uh, right. Uh, so I don't see necessarily we don't see uh, the role of ESO as a kind of umbrella under the alliances because the ni nature of alliance itself it's very individual right so it's a matter of the alliance itself how you would organize internationally it's a network you want to have this network and definitely it's not mm, necessary and I, I would say very much uh, that would that would completely not serve the purpose to uh, to aim for having an uh, overarching structure over alliances itself, because this is the this is the idea that the alliance should have its own its its own way, right? So it's a it's a it's a combination of the university from the different countries. But what we are doing right now is trying to figure out what are the obstacles still happening on the national level. So when we are meeting with, for example, students from alliances from country or from we are meeting with a few alliances itself, we are not asking 
how it is in the alliance in Sweden in the sense of how is your approach uh, commonly. And we also don't see this approach from the national unions that they want to have the common approach for these uh, alliances. So the, for example, unions of uh, the, the national unions of the certain country do not, uh, do not want to interfere and make this, aha, so this is this way how universities from direct country are involved in the alliances. What the unions want to do is to know whether the, uh, the students are being represented with the alliance properly, that's the first thing. And the second thing, if the implementation process will go through the alliance with the new initiatives like micro-credentials, like maybe new implementations on the national regulations, which will be there at the end, like it will end up in the ministry probably of, of some country X and so on. The very important is to maintain this bridge between the national stakeholders, which are having this directly connection to the leg legis legislation on the national levels to provide those changes in the student-oriented way in the country level. So to not keep the alliance uh, interfere with the, what's happening in the alliance in the sense of how it's being operated, how it's being managed and so on and so on. But at the end, if that's gonna implement to the whole European higher education area, to the whole education system within the countries, because we are still uh, talking about the countries existing in, 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 uh, in the Europe, uh, that's definitely going to impact not only alliances, that's going to impact every institution. If the framework of, for example, mm, I would say micro-credentials will be implemented on the country level, that's going to come up with the, with the need for the very like, open regulation, not only for the participants of the EU needs. That's why we believe this, this link is very uh, important to, to, to see because yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, kind of a change maker, right? Like we are thinking about the different approaches that could be taken. We are getting out of the status quo of the institutions within the alliances in this sense. So, so that's, that would be my answer to the first one. Uh, about awareness and visibility, uh, where students uh, should engage and how it should engage, definitely uh, for, um, like to, to, to check out what is the national realities, what, is, what are the national students. As a webpage is quite a, a good way to do. We are currently actually changing the webpage so it might be more informative in, uh, within the weeks. Uh, but if you go there uh, into about us and members, you're going to find your national uh, students' unions. In the case of Netherlands, it's ISO and LSVB. Um, so those two unions are, are very active from, from quite a lot of time uh, in, the, in the reality of, 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 of Netherlands. Uh, and that would be the first contact point. When it comes to international unions um, and international students that you, that you ask that are not necessarily Dutch, and might uh, face different needs. There are some organizations, for example, uh, that are uh, associated members of ESU, but not some of them are not still in ESU. For example, we have Association of Norwegian Students Abroad. So, for example, there are unions, there are, there are, there are different organizations that are kind of representing or at least networking and advocating for rights of the students from particular country, particular group of uh, society within the studying abroad within uh, like uh, out of the out of the national context so that might also be interesting to to discover and in general how to flourish the student movement and how to make uh, people more engaged in that i i would say it's a it's a very grassroots work and i can share my experience from my university because i think that's what i know the most right because the we have, when we have 5000 plus uh, institutions in europe we are in the different stages of how active the students' union, how different the students' tradition of engagement is, and so on and so on. And I'm not, I'm not definitely the expert of the students' uh, population in Maastricht University, so I don't, um, I don't necessarily know how it is uh, in there, how, how the students' union is um, active, how many participants in there. In, in our case, in the university, in the students' union, uh, we, had, we had active nearly 400 members in Prakov, at least when it comes to the very policy topics, talking with the different committees on quality assurance and so on and so on. But we also were building definitely the awareness of the students' movements through social media, very much important if you have people, I don't know, engaged in marketing, in social media, in developing the digital communication strategies. This is a very good testing ground to actually reach out the students widely, because of course we are probably in the far latter stage than having the old type of the uh, web of, of the of the fan page in the uh, in the corporation uh, with the starting with the f letter uh, but we are we are having very much new modes of communication we have all the all of the social media locally so promoting this locally through i don't know music festivals when hopefully it will be open through 
uh, also um, promoting, I don't know, a workshop on the student's rights. For example, student unions were giving a lot of workshops for every faculty in our universities about the student's rights. So those were actually the representatives that are going at the beginning of the year, going to the whole plenary of students with 500 students and saying, we are students unions, you have a problem, with, you, have a, you have a student's rights being, uh, being uh, impacted somehow this way or this way, you have a problem with assessment, reach us, we are students unions, we are here to defend your rights and so on. So also it's a very groundwork of the different organization, different students unions that are existing to also build up these connections because it's not possible from the SU side to say to the community on the faculty level, for example, or, or university level, build up the students movement or flourish with the act activity right so it, it actually it's a it's a it's a truly truly um truly truly grassroots initiative and that's very different that's very vary from from the universities when it's not the case to to the to the full extent thank you very much Jakub. Uh, in view of the time i want to leave the floor to leah to ask uh, her question please the floor is yours thank you i think it was partly answered already um you touched upon it, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mariolina. Um, I am a, an international student in Maastricht, so I come originally from Croatia, and I also study at a specific faculty of Maastricht in Venlo. And because Maastricht is such a big university with so many faculties, it's hard to get an overview and a grasp of what's happening at the very heart of it. So for me, at a different faculty as an international student, um, it can be challenging to know how I can get involved and where I can go and what I can do. I'm aware of a study association, but that's nowhere near of uh, what ESU is doing. Um, so from my perspective, it's more about um, how do I get involved as a person who cannot speak Dutch, who is here for at least another three to five years, um, but who wants to be involved in these things because in Croatia, obviously I cannot get representation because I don't attend the university there. And then in the Netherlands, it's hard because of the language and Maastricht is very international. Um, I have more internationals in my class than Dutch people. Um, so I'm assuming a lot of students have the same question. So that would be primarily, um, yeah, from my side, my point of view. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And shortly, I, 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 like, I don't want to, you know, ping pong this question uh, immediately, but that's the very good question to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the local union in, the, in this sense, how, how it could be organized, but what our standpoint uh, would be if the university is aiming to be international, if there is an, a, a lot of international students, the student representation also should reflect the students' body that are enrolled in the university. Either either when it comes to the, the structural environment or for example, through international committee and so on and so on. But that's definitely a topic to discuss because <clears throat> we cannot know the problem of international students without having them getting together and actually reflecting on their problems. So uh, for example, of my university in, in Krakow, the, the, the level of internationalization was very low. I mean, in, in many countries, uh, uh, from the from uh, like behind the the fall of the iron curtain the the number of international students is still very low it's about one percent something like this right so it's not very discussive topic yet so in my realities it was not the case and of course when somebody international student had a problem went directly to the international office of the whole university and that was the place to be engaged to to have all of the answers but uh, when it comes to the whole population i i think that's uh, that's a matter of of support of the of the university just to reflect on the actual i would say composition of the student student population in general and and uh, that's 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 very important to to ensure especially when when the, in the, it's very much in the strategy of, of different universities yeah, i think this is something that we can definitely follow up on uh, also with the central administration of the university um, and perhaps you know they will have an answer directly for you but if they don't maybe this is something we can also follow up with you jakub and we could even, you know, organize something uh, to see, you know, whether there are common problems that we can, you know, all uh, share ideas uh, to, to solve. Uh, but we'll be following up on, on that, Leah, for you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jakub, for, uh, for this very informative uh, talk. Uh, as Felix mentioned, uh, we'd like to, to follow up uh, perhaps on a couple of points you have mentioned. And in view of the time, I'd like to, to close this, uh, this talk. Thank you very much again. Thank you for those who participated and uh, stay tuned, of course, for the next uh, episode of uh, WhatsApp EU uh, Talks.
Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much.